Hello and welcome to Amagi, co-hosted by myself, Dylan Moore of the Volitional Science Network, which you can find on YouTube, and Nima Majur of EconomicsJunkie.com. We are here to tackle ideas, both ancient and modern, in an effort to bring you the tools needed to expand the power of your worldview, making you a more potent entity, professionally, politically, philosophically, or otherwise. We are graciously being hosted by the Think Liberty Network, which you can find at think-liberty.com. And this is going to be episode 21, our round three of Why Minsky Matters. And Nima, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, good. How are you doing, Dylan? I'm doing, well, I was going to say excellent, but I broke my foot on Friday. Ouch. And I just found out today, it's Monday, that I broke it. I mean, I know I heard it on Friday, but now I broke it. Now I got a six-week crutch extravaganza to look forward to. So other than that, I'm doing pretty good. But uh, I, I got tripped very specifically at Aikido class on Friday night. So, <laughs> but why we've, we've been going over Minsky. This is, this is round three. And I, I wanted to open this by asking you, of all the economics guys, economists that you've read, which is Rothbard and Murray and Minsky and who, Mises. About, Mises, who else am I missing? Hayek. Hayek. Um, Keynes, I guess. Although Keynes himself, I've never read. You've read. You've read him. Secondary sources about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all, which these- a lot of people, a lot of people do actually. <laughs> also, also part of the problem of. Uh, public perception of Keynes's writings actually I could believe that particularly <clears throat> I, I have to do a shout out to John Taylor Gatto watching the ultimate history lesson where it was given to me for the first time that always go back to the primary sources never ever rely on secondary sources to tell you what you to think about somebody's original writings and I guess Keynes <laughs> should yeah. be no exception to that but of all the economists that you think are important to talk about why is Minsky the one we're choosing for I think, three rounds now. Yeah, I think because Minsky is probably the most empirical economist that I've read. He uh, doesn't uh, get hung up on you know geometry and charts and graphs and theory, but he rather hangs out with bankers and um, talks to them about how banking works. And given that banking is very important in this economy... And the role of banks is vastly underestimated. A lot of economists uh, miss the boat on that, and they sort of look at banks as intermediaries who merely take in deposits and loan out funds. And Minsky has a much better, much more thorough understanding of banking, and that coupled with his general empiricism just uh, has produced a, a, a great deal of... Um, of data and knowledge on how the economy actually works that we live in. And so more and more people in the investment sector uh, are interested in Minsky, are also interested in MMT in general. So more because- people in the investment sector, which I I can only imagine the reason why that's important is because these are the people who are actually having to put their money where their mouth is and make actual predictions to make a exactly. living. Exactly, exactly. So, the, the yeah. people who are required to be accurate are looking to Minsky, is what you're saying. Yeah, and also the financial crisis, of course, of 2008 has brought back the uh, Minsky mo- so-called Minsky moment that a lot of people, or you, you may have heard that mentioned here and there once in a while, but really a lot of high-profile writers, they went back, back to Minsky's writings and he wrote about free and wrote and what happened it just uh, matches so uh, um well that uh, you know people just start thinking maybe the guy has something valuable to to contribute something to help me understand the system better and you use the word empiricism and i i feel really strange bringing this up and we've mentioned it in a few shows in the past that why is it so important particularly when we're talking about economics to bring up the fact that he's in Empirical. Shouldn't any economist be empirical? Right. Um, yeah. Any economist should be empirical. 
but it's also it's very annoying to be empirical you know if you build your mathematical model and it, all the charts look nice and everything uh, uh checks out well from start to finish or seemingly checks out well then you'd rather not rock the boat and you'd rather not challenge your model but minsky's entire approach is so anathema to that i'd almost say because um he recognizes the the ephemeral nature of institutions and of economies and of i guess ultimately civilizations as well and ephemeral i have an idea of what that word means but tell me what you yeah, mean, the, what you mean by it it comes to an end at some point mm. it's not uh, eternal and he also as we've probably pointed out in, in our previous uh, two shows on minsky um, points out that the regulatory system that needs to be in place to maintain and um, overlook this government-created banking system, because the entire regulatory regime that that needs to be put in place to oversee and check this government-created banking system needs to constantly evolve. Because part of Minsky's model recognizes that the private sector and the banking system in particular, the semi-private sector, will constantly adapt to the regulatory regime to a point where actually the regulations that are in place don't prevent the disaster they're supposed to prevent anymore. In many cases, they actually exacerbate it. So that's why Minsky's approach is... uh, is m- more refined in my opinion because it's just been because uh, he's been more open to uh, put it to the test via public data and uh, by talking to bankers and looking at w- what's actually going on in the economy bizarre talking to bankers well and then c- could we look at that a little bit too because it, it seems strange <laughs> you, you hear economists and you hear people who follow economists talk about what bankers do and what we found out is no, none of these people actually go into a bank and ask what's going on. Okay. Minsky appears to be one of these rare economists to say, OK, well, the banking system is kind of integral to the entire economy. Let me go in and ask what they're doing. Exactly. So as you recall from that podcast we dissected where uh, Bob Murphy had a conversation with Stefan from Free Domain Radio. Uh, Bob Murphy, who's an Austrian economist, uh, uh, flat out stated himself that Austrian economy, Austrian economics, doesn't really concern itself much with empirical data. Which that was the moment, and th- which is a problem. Yeah. Well, that that was the moment I, I completely lost faith in Austrian economics. Just completely. I'm like, oh, so right. it, it's it's just astrology. It's, it's just phrenology, right? You're, you're just making shit well, up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you said it right, faith, you know. Well, um, did, did you see Steph's face when he said that? His, his eyebrows and his eyes went a little bit wide uh, where he was, he was kind of like, what? And he's like, wait, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, I, that's show. totally not what I wanted to be doing. What did you just say? But he didn't challenge him on that. But um, it is, it, it's... It's a huge problem. It's so fundamental. And you can tell that it is a huge problem because the people who are trying to defend Bob Murphy's theories act like it's totally not a problem. Even though it's a huge issue to say, well, we're not into empirical data, that should be a red flag to anyone. And actually, some of the people on our podcast network, uh, I believe Vivini at the very least, I mean, he uh, caught on to that when he (laughs) came across that bit in our podcast. But... You know, we we just have to call it out. We have to point it out. What What is the Minsky stuff, the specifics that you want to bring up today that we that can help us better so understand last, economics? Yeah, the last uh, couple of shows, we talked a lot about the basics of MMT and uh, how banking works and how banks generate money out of nowhere and all that stuff. And now we're getting a little more into Minsky's unemployment. And, uh, unemployment how exactly so can you define unemployment again really quickly just so unemployment we're all on the is, right page unemployment is when people need money to pay the tax or 
by extension to pay their bills, pay debts, but can't get the money needed to pay those things. So in the U.S., you need dollars to pay your taxes. So you need to work for dollars to be able to pay your taxes and and make other expenditures on top of that. If nobody's willing to employ you, then you're unemployed. If nobody's willing to give you money for work, then you're unemployed. And specifically, that's a result of a lack of private sector net savings. Correct, which is the result of overtaxation by the state because government spending minus taxes equals pretty large chunk of net private savings. It's like the faucet that runs into the net, net private savings pool, private sector net savings pool, right? Exactly. The hot tub, yeah. All right, so this is from uh, the chapter Poverty and Unemployment, page 121. Minsky had earlier argued that an expansion led by the private sector tends to increase private indebtedness and financial fragility as debt service payments rise relative to prospective business revenues. In contrast, an expansion led by public sector spending could actually enhance stability by, pro- by providing safe assets, government bonds issued as the budget moved to deficit. What we've already discussed before, uh, an expansion led by private sectors essentially sort of like the situation where when towards the end of the 90s, the federal government budget moved towards or basically moved into surplus territory. Private sector was hugely drained of net private savings. And so started borrowing from the banking system and private indebtedness went to, to new, new record, private debt to income went to new record highs. And then a sort of a, a repeat of that or an, a, um, an exacerbated repeat of that what ha- occurred in around 2005, 2006, when the uh, import balance also moved towards the import deficit, sorry, the uh, the trade deficit hugely increased, and the private sector was hugely drained of net private savings, essentially, and instead started borrowing from the banking system to continue spending and expanding, etc. So that would be a private sector led expansion, which gets shakier and shakier because private debt uh, to income ratios rise. And the bigger the debt to the income becomes, the more entities are moving into sp- speculative or even Ponzi positions. Well, and then, sorry and to interrupt, we discussed- uh, Randall Ray, who, who you're reading from, uh, put that very uh, succinctly, what, what you just read, is that as incomes rise, the debt ratio or uh, the, the debt service that a business has to deal with, but essentially their, their debt payments – is isn't increasing accordance with their income it's increasing in accordance with their expected income so so they're right. making a guess saying okay we want to aim at this amount of income so let's increase our debt load to you know grow our business and to shoot for that but because they're relying on the private sector to borrow that from which eventually has to get paid back th- there's going to be a tipping point where it can't it the private sector can't push that growth any further financially until and the only way is to either export surplus or deficit spending that could induce the necessary income for income to catch up with the indebtedness but if that doesn't happen then at one point private sector will run into payment problems and you will have one or two big institutions default you'll have the entire systems fragility exposed You'll have individuals hugely in debt and uh, businesses cutting down and you'll have a recession, et cetera, et cetera, until the government moves back to deficit, uh, which counteracts uh, a lot of this usually. This analysis is interesting in light of the problems created during the Clinton boom of the 1990s. An expansion led by private sector borrowing with a federal budget that moved to large surpluses. As we know in retrospect, the decade of debt-fueled consumption growth from 1996 to 2006 ultimately contributed to the collapse in 2007. Indeed, 
It is impossible to understand the global financial crisis without recognizing the importance played by household borrowing to fuel home purchases as well as consumption. <clears throat> the post-war era was characterized by a preference for private investment strategies to promote private spending and economic growth and private indebtedness with that. Even as the war on poverty got underway, the Johnson administration demonstrated its preference for private sector spending strategies, passing tax cuts in 1964 and again in 1965 and 1966. By encouraging private sector spending, especially investment, policymakers aim to stimulate growth in total income. But the strategies did little to improve the conditions of lower middle income workers e.g. factory workers, whose real incomes declined by 2.5% over the period 1965 through 1970. Things were even worse after that, as blue-collar wages stagnated over the decades following 1970. Furthermore, the private investment strategies tended to exacerbate economic inequality, generate inflation, and undermine financial stability. I don't know what... Uh, the tax cuts were exactly that were passed in 64 or 65. But I think a lot of those were just only tax cuts that would specifically stimulate investment by corporations and not really private uh, income taxes. Right. So it's at least not to a large It's extent. kind of a progressive chant of, you know, you're, the, the tax cuts are only going to the wealthy sort of situation. Right, right. But the, the, the bottom line is... I think that, I mean, I think tax cuts would actually, if they were substantial and if they were broad and Aimed at the middle class. Aimed at the middle class, aimed at incomes, uh, 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 aimed at, uh, and, and, you know, without any, without any fear of increasing the deficit, uh, th that would be the only effective form of tax cuts to boost private sector net savings and thus economic growth. But uh, any any half-hearted attempts to this uh, uh, to cutting taxes won't really do much. You know the Clinton boom of the '90s. I think under Clinton, actually, there was actually also some tax cuts, but then also the spending uh, was reduced. In the end, the deficit moved to surplus. And as we said before, I think MMT are the only ones to recognize that that leads to private sector debt boom more than anything. So when the federal government balance moves to surplus. Right, because there's no other place Unless to get the money. Unless you have countries like Germany. Yeah. Unless you have countries like Germany who have an export surplus. And as we mentioned over and over, those the two main sources, two only sources of private sector net savings, government deficits and export surpluses. Page 123, you know, talking about sort of what uh, Minsky proposed to combat unemployment poverty. Minsky argued that consumption is the most stable component of aggregate demand, since households consume a fairly high and, and stable fraction of income. So long as consumption is financed out of income rather than debt, a high consumption economy would be more stable. For that reason, Minsky al Minsky's alternative would stress policy that favors high consumption rather than high investment, fueled by policies that would increase wages and incomes at the bottom of the distribution. More now, government spend. Can I interrupt you here real quick, Dima? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is sounding a little bit contrary to what we've been talking about before. So it, Minsky's suggesting here that as long as the co consumption spending is coming out of income and not out of debt, that this is... What was the term that he used? It's it's uh, better for, at employing the lower classes than investment spending. So consumption spending is more stable and less volatile. Mm. Once it's, people are, uh, if it, as long as it's out of income, right? And uh, because individuals who get accustomed to certain lifestyle, you know, just consume the same things, and over time. Uh, they increase their expenses so long as they're financed out of income, not out of debt. Just one problem that uh, occur start occurring later on. So a lot of consumption too started being financed out of credit card debt, and so that has made consumption a more volatile component as well. But investment spending by companies is more volatile. Yeah, because they can boom and bust really easily. They can get excited and exactly. if it, if it, race forward and things look crush good. themselves. So, so that's why Minsky Minsky says, and consumption is in most uh, developed economies is the largest 
component of GDP anyway. So consumption means this, the amount of resources directed towards producing consumer goods, essentially, mm-hmm. versus the amount of resources directed towards building machines and computers. Uh, the the uh, transi- transition job program would be a more consumption-based solution because the individuals uh, receiving income at the lower uh, yeah, income range... Yeah, they're just going to spend it on consumption. Consume more, yeah. Furthermore, government spending, especially on wages, should play a major role in generating growth. This is because a sovereign government can increase its spending, even if that results in a budget deficit, without increasing risk of insolvency and default. In contrast, if private spending leads the way, it will tend to outpace income of households and firms, meaning that private indebtedness will grow. That is risky and ultimately unsustainable. You know, when, whenever we talk about private indebtedness, what we really mean is the private sector's indebtedness to the banking system. And the banking system is not really all that private, <laughs> just to be clear. Right. The banking it- system is actually just another government program. It's public-private because the deposits are, uh, are insured by the government, but other liabilities such as your know, shareholders uh, and uh, other types of debt issued are not insured. Their risk is um, borne by the private sector. When we say private indebtedness, we just mean indebtedness to the banking system. Right. And of which course, is uh, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, just another government program. Sorry. Yeah, well, and yeah. I was just going to say the way that the money is generated for the banking system is completely government defined. So, because we have a tendency to think that when we say, okay, I'm going into private debt, it's like I went over to NEMA and I said, hey, NEMA, can I borrow 10 bucks that you have? And then NEMA takes 10 bucks that he has, gives it to me, and so $10 that already existed moved from him to me, and that's the transaction, and that's why I owe him $10. With With the banking system, we're just going into essentially a government branch of money creation, and saying, okay, I yeah. need $100,000. And they say, okay, we're going to wave the magic government wand. Bam, there's $100,000. And now you owe us $100,000 back plus interest. And the only real difference between that and the deficit spending from directly from the, the federal government itself is that with the deficit spending, nobody owes it back. It's just out there, right? The, the government's going to tax right. some of it back in order to give value to the money to begin with, but they don't need it due to spending constraints. They don't need it in order to be able to afford stuff. Hence, Minsky's policy would favor both greater equality and greater stability. To permanently improve the lot of the poor, Minsky believed that policymakers needed to address the question of income distribution. The questions that need uh, answering if someday a serious war on poverty is to be mounted relate to the distribution of income and the available policy tools which can affect the distribution of income in the relatively short run. How, he asked, can the distribution of income be improved? He answered, first of all, by full employment. By this, Minsky meant that it was necessary to achieve and sustain tight full employment, which he defined as the situation that exists when over a broad cross-section of occupations, industries, and locations, employers at going wages and salaries would prefer to employ more workers than they in fact do. That would be the case where job vacancies normally exceed the number of job seekers. This would require a bolder, more imaginative, and more consistent use of expansionary monetary and fiscal policy to create jobs than we have witnessed to date. The achievement and sustaining of tight full employment could do almost all of the job of eliminating poverty. Here, Minsky's position is consistent with his notion that a large portion of those living in poverty and an even larger portion of those living close to poverty do so because of the meager income they receive from work, a point we have also emphasized earlier. Minsky really completely challenges this entire paradigm that we have right now where everywhere around the world, it's just a fact, where we've gotten used to... Uh, some uh, pool of unemployed that will always be there. That is, of course, austerity. Austerity is a government program, of course. And that benefits those who employ workers versus the workers themselves. Because if you, if you make 
uh, job vacancies scarce by doing austerity, then you're making life harder for uh, unskilled and, and low skilled uh, workers. Mm -hmm. Versus, if you have a situation where you always have everyone fully employed, uh, and you have you know more vacancies than um, work workers, then people can always jump out of their current employment into a different uh, uh, employment, into a different career, a different position, if they want to, and they have much more bargaining power with their employers, and they would be much less insecure in their position, in, in their uh, situation. I have an objection I want to address, because as we're on a libertarian network, I want to look at the libertarian view and how diametrically opposed to it this sounds, because, you know, a libertarian is going to look at the unemployed pool and say, OK, you know, part of those people are people who simply don't want to work, which I think that there is a pool of people who simply don't want to work and aren't interested in it. But uh, on top of that, there's also a pool of people who can't get well, work. Also, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. just to be clear, yeah, there are a lot of those people, and that's because of the welfare state. Right. And Minsky Which, is uh, against uh, uh, the welfare state um, and uh, against paying uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, uh, sorry, against paying people for not working, essentially. I, I am against Except that as well. Except for the ones who can't, you know. But, um, so yeah, sorry, go, uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so the, the other pool is people who would otherwise be able to find a job if the government would simply stop screwing with stuff like regulations and minimum wage and licensing and, and you know, all, all these other things where uh, the government sticks their hand in, uh, according to the government, to help fix things, and all it does is create a kink in the flow of the economy where there's going to be some crony capitalist that wins at the expense of some dude who's now unemployed who can't who can't be valuable enough to earn minimum wage because the the minimum wage cut them off and you know if we implement a transition job like we've talked about before then there would be no need for a minimum wage because right now a transition job wage would set the floor would effectively be the minimum wage well the, exactly. the one thing that i wanted to say to the objection is a reminder of the fact that money like remember as Nima defined in the beginning being unemployed is it, being in a state where you want to get the money that you need to pay taxes with but you're unable to and the reason that we're in this situation is because the state has demanded taxes to begin with and that the money itself is a creation of the state so because exactly. because the state has demanded taxes it, it, unless the state gives you the to uh, an ability to get the token to pay those taxes, by definition, you're in the state of unable to get get the tokens, which means you're unemployed. So to say, okay, there's are simp This is dead. Or if the state doesn't do that, then your only option is to private sector's only option is to go to the banking system and go in debt, and that'll cause a crisis ultimately. Right. What I wanted to say is, I know it, it to a libertarian ear, or even a conservative ear, it sounds blasphemous, or it sounds socialistic to talk about, okay, this, this federal job guarantee, or this federal transition job, where the government just hires people, and isn't that going to cause a bunch of runaway inflation, and where are they going to get the money to do that? Well, if we understand that the federal government is a sole creator of money and it has to get it out there somehow in order for people to have it any to have it in the first place to do anything with it what we're talking about are different ways for it to get out there and instead of just like Nima was reading from that in the 60s the goal was to, to aim it at investment which is very volatile why not have at least partially this organization or this you know this federal transition job that aims at the poorest people and says okay we are going to give you a method in which you can acquire these tokens that you need to participate in the economy right yeah. it, it's it's yes it's a state solution but it's the, it's a solution from a state created problem all the status system already so the only way to get out of the status system would be to get rid of taxation altogether and then we can talk right but until then there's uh, you know you have all these issues correct so now talking some more about tight full employment because there's some worries about inflation obviously in order to keep the overall price level fairly stable prices of other goods and services would have to be constrained 
Minsky suggested that in the high wage, sorry, in the high wage industries, wages would have to rise by less than the increase in the productivity of their workers. To prevent firms from simply increasing their profits, it was necessary to ensure that management in these often oligopolistic industries would have to pass this decline in unit costs on to their customers. Thus, he argued that effective profit and price constraints would have to accompany tight, full employment. If inflationary pressures were not constrained, Minsky feared that the political popularity of full employment would be undermined. However, the inflation constraint is much less of a concern in today's global economy. First, deflationary pressures around the globe are substantial, as many nations keep domestic demand depressed in order to run trade surpluses, looking to the United States to provide demand for the world's excess output. This is very important. Most importantly, many of the global exporters have very low wages, which keeps global prices down. This means that U.S. firms face substantial price competition so that even relatively rapid growth, such as that experienced in the Clinton expansion and again in the years before the global financial crisis, does not produce significant inflationary pressures. Second, technological advances and removal of trade restrictions have increased wage competition from abroad, reducing the likelihood that low unemployment would generate a wage price spiral. Finally, much of the 70s and 80s concern with low productivity growth disappeared during the Clinton boom when productivity growth returned to more normal long-run averages. Indeed, since the mid-70s, the problem has been that average wages have grown much more slowly than labor productivity, in part because of globalization of production. To the extent that such comp competitive pressures keep wage growth in line with pr productivity growth, price pressures will remain moderate. But, I mean, I think the biggest point here... To me, is that infl any inflation, any concerns about inflation right now are overblown because the entire world is, is so primed for austerity. Uh, everyone has this austerity mindset. Yeah, of, can, can you unpack um, that a little bit the, more? So the the, the there's what was the, that? can you unpack that a little more that we have all these d deflationary pressures and you're going into the fact that the world has been primed for austerity. And so, uh, essentially, what you're saying is the whole world is lacking in its own tax tokens in whatever country it's in, right? Because we're like everybody's experiencing austerity at the same time. Pretty much, most almost all countries in the world are under this paradigm of taxes, fund spending. We need to raise taxes to 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 have new government programs, etc. So, you know, MMT is not very widely recognized anywhere in the world and where that's the case you and, and you look at europe you look at japan you just have constant uh, concerns about budget deficits and inflation uh, you know which, even though no inflation is, is really happening in these countries but uh, constant concern with with government budget deficits taxes being too low supposedly the entire mindset is so primed for austerity there's so much more wealth that could be produced and consumed before we'd be hitting any uh, territory of full resource utilization. And so for that reason, there's no, no real reason to be worried about budget deficits causing inflation and federal job guarantee causing inflation and stuff like that. Right. And particularly, I, you read the number from Ray somewhere. I can't remember what it was, but couldn't the federal job guarantee be accomplished with 1% of GDP? Yeah, so, much, uh, so many problems would be resolved. You know, cr crime... Uh, incarceration rates, violence, welfare. I mean, depression, I drug like, abuse. I welfare. like Warren Mosler's take on it, where he said, because he's been questioned when he brought, but he brings up this idea when they say, so you're saying we should get rid of the welfare and replace it with the, this federal transition job at the same time, and he goes, no, no, keep everything in place as it is now, and we'll add this federal transition job, and we'll see how many people actually move off of the welfare. Because I think, this is Warren, I think people actually want to work and they just don't have the opportunity. Yeah, that, so much for the uh, deflationary pressures. Now, moving on to chapter six, which is called Minsky and the Global Financial Crisis. On page 137, there's a great quote from Minsky from 1987 that Ray just put here. And it was to me, it was just mind-blowing mind and eye-opening. Securitization 
reflects a change in the weight of market and bank funding capabilities. So just to be clear, securitization is when you make a security out of some income stream. Generally, if it's a debt, like a mortgage-backed security, for example, that's securitization where traditionally banks would just hold the mortgage till maturity and earn interest. But then they started selling those mortgages to other people or selling them to, to hedge funds, selling them to organizations who would package them into a, a pool of mortgages and, tr- and then they would be traded on the stock market. So that's securitization. Whenever an income stream is turned into a tradable security. Okay, so the one more time. Securitization reflects a change in the weight of market and bank funding capabilities. Market funding capabilities have increased relative to the funding abilities of banks and depository financial intermediaries. It is in part a lagged response to monetarism. The fighting of inflation by constraining monetary growth opened opportunities for non-banking financing techniques. Well, so let's slow so, down. I want to unpack that. That was dense. Yeah. So he's basically saying is that to fund as an as a entrepreneur, to fund your project, there are basically two different uh, opportunities or two different uh, routes you can go. One is you go to a bank and you get a bank loan. The other is you do an IPO or you sell stocks and you have investors. And so the, the they give you money. And you sell stock in return. So what Minsky is saying is that because of monetarism, uh, this paradigm has emerged in the late 70s and early 80s, where the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. just started raising interest rates like crazy to levels like like uh, almost close to 20% for a savings account. Correspondingly, to borrow uh, became really expensive as well, and you just couldn't get a loan, I guess, below 18% or something like that. As a reaction to that, the private sector, as a workaround, came up with more uh, more stock-based financing where you just sell stocks rather than go to a bank. Oh, I get it. And then and they, t- they took stuff, for example, like a mortgage-backed security where they said, okay, I had this mortgage, which previously – you know, it was just an income stream for the bank. I'm going to package it up. And then now that mortgage-backed security represents a certain amount of actual money that can be bought and sold. Now, from yeah. this mortgage, yeah. I could generate money, whereas I could that, because I can't get it directly from the bank because the money's too expensive. It's another way to generate money from a different avenue. Do I got that right? Mortgage-backed securities, I think they came a little later. But so if you look at all the debt versus all the the shares of common stock in the economy. Back in the days, it was much more common to have bank financing business. To have more to have more bank debt than common stock. But then I over see. the years, common stock financing has just made up a, a larger and larger share of financing. Because activities. it was because it was more and more difficult to get it from the bank. He suggests that it's because of monetarism, because of the idea that high interest rates can fight inflation, and that if we reduce, if we uh, constrain credit growth, then we can combat inflation, mm-hmm. which um, of course hasn't really uh, worked. And it, you know, we've talked before why that why it doesn't really work. Right. Just look at Japan. So for that, but but I thought that was an interesting, very uh, going to the root cause of this whole trend of why does everyone have stocks in their portfolio? Why are there stocks everywhere? Why, why are there literally entire TV channels dedicated to following the day-to-day movements of stocks and stuff like that? It's all a f- part of a phenomenon. We have actively encouraged the uh, financing through common stock and we've discouraged from bank financing. And so we're uh, in the situation. I mean, I remember when I was growing up, in Germany, barely anyone was talking about their stocks, you know, maybe very rich people only, but it wasn't even a major component in mm-hmm. anyone's life or anyone's finances. Moving on to page 141, the long transformation to instability. Many aspects to this transformation, and Minsky was certainly not the only one to notice it. Some call it the rise of casino capitalism, and many identified it as financialization. In important respects, it was simil- similar to Hilferding's finance capitalism with what were called non-bank banks or later shadow banks. 
rising to challenge the investment banks and the commercial banks. This development also provided justification for dropping the New Deal reforms so that the banks could compete with the new intruders who were poaching business. This is a huge topic, but the important point is that even as shadow banks pushed financial practice to new frontiers, the commercial and less regulated investment banks insisted that they had to follow suit. At the same time, the structure of incentives and rewards was changed such that risky bets, high leverage ratios, and short-term profits were promoted over long-term firm survival and returns to investors. Many, if not most, of the new practices served no social purpose beyond making top management of financial institutions incredibly rich. A good example of the transformation was the conversion of the venerable investment banks like Goldman Sachs from partnerships to publicly held firms with hired and richly rewarded management. By the way, I didn't know this, but apparently all the way into the 90s, most of these investment banks were completely private. They were not publicly traded. Yeah, that was news to me just now. Yeah. The structure and practices were somewhat different. The results were similar to those that led up to the great crash in 1929. Pump and dump incentives were created. You see, through common stock financing, you create pump and dump incentives. You You get this incentive for people to run up the stock price for top management to run up the stock price and cash out, uh, future be damned. Dump incentives were created through which top management would exercise stock options, pump assets and equity prices, and then sell out, dump their own stocks before the speculative boom collapsed. What we see by the early 2000s is the coalescence of three phenomena that made the biggest financial institutions extremely dangerous. The return of pump and dump strategies ripping off customers and shareholders, the move from partnerships to the corporate form, which increases the agency problems, institutions run the interest of management, uh, run in the interest of management, not owners, and excessive executive compensation that was tied to short-term performance, i.e. by rewarding them with stock options, which increases the pressures to cheat or to do anything else that justifies huge bonuses. Tell me a little bit more about shadow banks again, how they led right. into what you just described. Banks are organizations that have lots of money at their disposal and they can can do the work that banks do, but just without being subject to the same uh, scrutiny and regulations. So, for example, university endowments, uh, large hedge funds, money market mutual funds, so, Credit card companies, technically as well. A lot of those are run by the banks themselves. But so essentially, um, yeah. companies that even though they can't generate money out of thin air like banks can, they've got so much money that it doesn't matter. They they have similar lending. Well, powers. they also kind of do generate money out of thin air. Uh, the only problem being that in their case, their their deposits are not government insured. Um, they try to sort of they try to play the role of banks without having the backing. And as long as everything's fine, it doesn't matter. Like As long as no one demands settlement in actual currency, then it goes fine. But as soon as there's a cash, there's sort of a crunch, people, people need cash, then the weakness of the shadow banks uh, transpires. And that's also what happened during the crisis where a lot of shadow banks uh, actually... Um, needed assistance from the Fed, and we're also actually assisted by the Fed. Also, money market mutual funds. You know, like, you can put your money in a money market mutual fund, and it it acts just like a bank deposit, pretty much. You can write checks against it. And during good times, it's all good. It doesn't really matter. But uh, during bad times, it's possible that they actually, what's called break the buck, so that they actually might not be able to deliver the dollars that they claim are in your account. Also, they're able to do riskier practices. So that's what sort of created this effect of the shadow banks taking away business and profits from the uh, regular banks. And the regular banks started getting involved with more riskier practices. 
in order to catch up. So just to follow suit, I, I think you read that where they where the regular banks when they saw that what the shadow banks were doing instead of going to government and saying hey slow those guys down, they said hey government speed us up so we could compete with these guys. That's did what I- the government did too, with Black Eagle, etc. Okay, yeah, I'll just read a little bit about what's called money manager capitalism. Except what's another thing that's interesting about Minsky is he distinguishes, he really uh, tries to uh, distinguish different t- types of capitalism by just, you know, recognizing when there a, a change occurred and how the system was run, how money was lent. and Similar to um, Quigley. How the institutions were running the system. So the system that we are in now that he calls money manager capitalism that's this new stage where you know lots of shadow banks etc minsky called this new stage money manager capitalism this name draws attention to a characteristic feature huge pools of funds under management by professionals pension funds sovereign wealth funds hedge funds university endowments corporate treasuries and so on every money manager had to beat the average return to retain clients something that is of course statistically impossible But with such incentives and with virtually no government regulation or oversight of shadow banking, this encouraged not only risky behavior, but also ethically compromised actions. In Minsky's view, the rise of these managed funds was caused by the success of the earlier managerial welfare state capitalism, the absence of depressions and relatively good growth, plus policies that favored private pensions, such as tax exemptions allowed financial wealth to grow over the entire post-war period. Although financial crises came along and wiped out some wealth, each crisis was contained so that most wealth survived and quickly resumed growth and recovery. What was really important was the dynamic created by the shift of power away from banks to the very lightly regulated money managers at the shadow banks. To compete, banks needed to subvert regulations through innovations and then to have them legislatively eliminated. This dynamic allowed banks to increase leverage ratios and thus risk to keep uh, keep pace with shadow banking practice. There was a Gresham's Law in operation. Those institutions that could reduce capital ratios and loss reserves the most quickly were able to increase net earnings and thus rewards to management and investors. Furthermore, there was a shift to maximization of share prices as one of the main goals of management, which supposedly aligned the interest of shareholders and top managers who receive stock options and compensation. That in turn encouraged short-term focus on performance in equity markets, which, as we already discovered in 29, is accomplished through market manipulation, both legal and illegal. Again, top management was incentivized to engage in pump and dump once they exercised stock options. And... They could make tens of millions of dollars and even much more this way. The problem was that the sheer volume of financial wealth under management outstripped socially useful investment. To keep returns high, money managers and bankers had to turn to increasingly esoteric financial speculation in areas that not only did not serve the public purpose, but actively subverted it. An example would be the rise of index speculation in commodities markets that drives up global f- uh, prices of energy and food, leading to hunger and even starvation around the world. The dot-com bubble is another example. Speculators drove up the price of stocks and internet companies with no business model or prospective profits. The inevitable crash wiped out hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth. Another example of speculation against public interest is the U.S. real estate boom that began before 2000 and finally collapsed in 2007, triggering the global financial crisis. It was the biggest speculative boom in U.S. history and was driven by money managers who created complex securities and derivatives for speculative bets, with many of those bets actually paying off If the homeowners defaulted and lost their homes, I believe that's the credit default swaps. Right. And that's the thing that the bankers should have, or these money capitalist managers should have been going to jail for, where they they essentially sold these securities and these derivatives and were simultaneously betting that they would fail. Right. The problem created from the experience of the Clinton years is that the wrong lesson was learned. The Clinton administration and many Democrats continued to believe that the budget surpluses were good for the economy. We still hear this all the time, right? Never make that connection that, oh, but then also it 
big crash occurred, right? Indeed, they argue that the Goldilocks growth was caused by government budget surpluses. They point to the Bush deficits that followed the recession in 2000 as an example of mismanagement of the budget. And so when the global financial crisis finally hit the economy, they joined with Republicans in keeping the fiscal response too small, arguing that budget deficits are dangerous when too large. Economic slowdown began to lower tax revenues after 2008. The new Obama administration saw the budget deficit explode to 10% of GDP, the highest since World War II. This explosion generated concern about deficits that made it difficult to get support for stimulus on the appropriate scale. As a result, the economy would not recover robustly. The correct lesson should have been the view pro propagated at the Levi Institute following the work of Minsky and Godley. The Clinton budget surpluses were dangerous because they implied private sector deficits were, that were unsustainable. Economic growth was fueled by bubbles, especially in real estate, and these bubbles require growing debt throughout the private sector. When private debt became too big, consumers stopped borrowing and the bubble collapsed. Far from being dangerous... The growing budget deficits of big government were necessary to prevent the global financial crisis from deteriorating to another Great Depression. Still, even more fiscal stimulus was needed to proactively boost recovery. But that couldn't happen because economists and policymakers had learned the wrong lesson from the Clinton years. It was actually the robust growth that boosted tax revenues and resulted in unsustainable budget surpluses. The surpluses were unsustainable because they required deficits in the private sector that generated too much private debt. And we've talked about that many times. Uh, the paradigm of austerity is still alive and well, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, it, and, it's like you just said where you were the first person to point it out to me, the fact that there was a, a government budget surplus right before the crash and that nobody seems to have put that together. Right. And then now... Of course, to say that that happened before the crash and then the crash happened isn't isn't empirical enough because you could point at all sorts of stuff that happened before the crash and then the crash happened. But the budget surplus has happened seven times in American history. 2008 was the seventh time. And every single time it's happened, it was followed by a economic crash. So this is what we're talking about. When Depression. We're ta yeah, this is what we're talking about when we talk about emp empiricism is that... When we look at what's happened in history, particularly when we're t talking about American history here, and we say, okay, this is the model that we've pointed out where we say, okay, when the government uh, deficit goes down and even turns into a surplus, what that's doing is it's requiring the private sector to depend on itself more and more, which it can't because that money has to get paid back because they're simply going in debt to the banking system. Uh, that will that will cause a bubble to, to to expand and pop where everything snaps back and creates a depression. Well, that's exactly what's happened seven times in U.S. history. Completely predictable. Exactly. So we have tons and tons of evidence that there's something wrong with the budget surplus paradigm. Moving on to financial reform, page 180. The old idea that the central bank can exert control over banks by rationing reserves is wrong. In normal times, that would cause it to miss its target rate. In troubled times, it would worsen the crisis. The liability side of a bank balance sheet is the wrong side to try to exert control. If the central bank wants banks to lend less, it needs to discipline the asset side. That is, control the quantity or quality of loans directly through credit controls, for example, that limit the growth of uh, the growth rate of loans or set lower limits to down payments. In summary, the central bank should and it must accommodate the liquidity needs of banks. However, the central bank should supervise the balance sheet of banks, conduct cash flow analysis, and pursue policy that promotes macroeconomic and financial stability. Here, once again, talk we talk about the the, the fact that. There's no such thing as curbing bank lending by imposing reserve requirements or raising interest rates and or reducing the amount of re reserves available, raising the interest on reserve loans. None of this reduces bank lending because banks don't need reserves to lend. And uh, people who don't talk to bankers or are, are not interested in how the bank works talk a great deal about how 
um, <laughs> banks work and how bank lending works without knowing how it actually does. So in reality, banks make a loan first by marking up deposits and then later on they obtain reserves as needed, mostly for clearing, but also for tax payments and withdrawals. And then, of course, for the regulatory reserve requirement, which basically just functions like a tax on the banks, nothing more, nothing less. What we talk about here is basically, so if we really want to curb bank lending, uh, then the Federal Reserve needs to look at the asset side of the banks, that is the loans that they make, not the, how they finance those loans, not you know the reserve side of uh, uh, of the equation, but the underwriting literally side. impose requirements on how they make loans to businesses and entities. Sorry, you were saying? Yeah, no, they, they need to be looking at the underwriting requirements. So, and we, that's what we're getting to. So, on page 182, improving underwriting. Banks that receive government protection in the form of liquidity and partial solvency guarantees are essentially public-private partnerships, which is basically all banks. They promote the public purpose by specializing in activities that they can perform more competently than the government can do. One of these activities is underwriting, assessing creditworthiness, in building relations with borrowers that enhance borrower willingness to repay. Over, a past, over the past decade, a belief that underwriting is unnecessary flowered and then exploded. In the aftermath of the crisis, financial institutions discovered that credit ratings, credit scores, and the credit default swap premium cannot substitute for underwriting. You see, they were, they, they were hoping that these market-based betting measures would eliminate the necessity to underwrite because the um, credit default swap premiums, etc., and credit scores, they, they would all tell you all you need, you need to know. In part because those can be manipulated, but also because elimination of relationship banking changes the behavior of borrowers and lenders. This situation means that, a, that past default rates become irrelevant as credit raters discovered. If banks are not doing good underwriting, it is difficult to see why government needs them as partners. It would be much simpler to have government directly finance activities it perceives to be in the public interest. Home mortgages, student loans, state and local government infrastructure, and even small business activities, commercial real estate, and working capital expenses. In other words, the government could just directly make the loans rather than backstopping private banks that make them. In the United States, the federal government has tended to favor guaranteeing private debt over directly making loans. There is a compelling argument for government reliance on guarantees over making loans directly if private financial institutions are better underwriters than government can be. However, if the private financial institutions are not doing good underwriting, as they did not do in the case of the U.S. home mortgages, then bypassing guarantees in favor of direct lending makes sense. Indeed, there has been a movement in that direction with government taking back control over student loans. When government guarantees both the deposits and the loans, for example, mortgages and student loans, it is difficult to see any role to be played by banks except underwriting, deciding who is sufficiently creditworthy to obtain a loan guaranteed by Uncle Sam. I have never so, thought about it that way. Uh, I tend to agree, and I've probably said that before, but the current system, the current banking system is basically a, a government program, but it's cloaked in private brands and labels and names, Chase Bank this, J.B. Morgan that, Citibank this, and Wells Fargo. Preferable, well, if, if the government is doing it all anyway, is backstopping it all, then why not just make it a government bank? You know, just stop pretending. So at least be honest about what you're doing uh, with your customers and with people right and if there's no underwriting standards the one thing that the private sector was was supposed to be better at than the government which was okay we know better what to do with this money well if you're screwing that up what's the point right oh by the way what i just read was improving underwriting which is one reform to promote prudent banking and we're just going through the next one now which is increasing capital requirements it has long been believed that capital requirements are a proper way to regulate bank lending. Higher capital requirements not only make banks safer, but they also constrain bank lending unless the bank 
banks can raise capital. Unfortunately, according to Minsky, neither claim is correct. Higher capital requirements were imposed in the aftermath of the savings and loan fiasco, and they were codified in the Basel agreements. Rather than constraining bank purchases of assets, banks simply moved assets and liabilities off their balance sheets, putting them into special purpose vehicles, for example. What's a capital requirement in terms of... For a that bank? the bank needs to have X amount in a shareholder's equity versus... Oh, like home loans versus auto loans versus... So, so how much of... The, I mean, banks generally just have, have a tiny equity portion. So, um, and it's just part of the part and parcel of the banking system. But that's basically the idea is to capital requirements is to to uh, require banks to have a larger shareholder uh, ownership component, essentially. You'd have oh, I more money paid in to, to back up the loans that they're making. So this idea, and we're exploring this idea right now, you know, and why Minsky thinks it's not a good idea. Uh, Basel also used risk-adjusted weightings for capital requirements to encourage banks to hold less risky assets for which they were rewarded with lower capital requirements. The idea is that the risk-weighted requirements would encourage banks to stay out of the riskiest activities. But even if they didn't, the higher capital ratio could absorb losses. Unfortunately, banks gamed the system in two ways. Since risk weightings were by class, banks would take the riskiest positions allowed in each class, and banks worked with credit ratings agencies to structure assets, assets such as mortgage-backed securities to achieve the risk weighting desired. For example, it was relatively easy to get a triple A rated uh, to get triple A rated tranches as safe as sovereign government debt out of packages of subprime and liar loan alt A mortgages with, with 85 to 90 percent of the risky mortgages underlying investment grade, supposedly very safe tr- tranches. But in reality, the credit raters were ignoring or at least downplaying risk. Finally, Minsky argued that all else being equal, high capital ratios necessarily reduce return on equity and hence growth of net worth. So it is not necessarily true that higher capital ratios increase safety of banks because it means that they are less profitable. Indeed, with higher capital ratios, they need to choose higher risk return. Uh, they need to choose a higher risk return portfolio of assets to achieve a target return on equity. If regulators want to constrain the rate of growth of risky lending, it appears that direct credit controls are better. Regulators can either set maximum limits to the rate of growth of the volume of bank loans or total assets or discourage certain kinds of lending, for example, by requiring higher down payments or better collateral or higher loan-to-value ratios. So that's kind of interesting, uh, but you require higher capital ratios. It means you have more capital paid in. So, you, uh, so you'll take risk, your riskier and riskier bets in order to get that capital to get paid in? Did I get that right? Because Yeah, because if you have to have more money paid in, for example, via shareholders' equity, let's say you want to start a bank, you used to be able to start it with, with uh, uh, 25000 and now you need 100000 on the 100,000, all else being equal, you're still making the same return as you did previously on the 25,000. So now you have a, uh, now you're encouraged to make riskier loans or, or at least push the boundaries of whatever, make it as risky as possible so that you can, on the same amount of uh, a yield in percentage terms that you were making previously with your $25,000. Mm hmm paid in it's kind of backfired may, may, potentially makes banks even uh, less risk averse on the other hand there's not much that can be done to encourage banks to lend when they do not want to that is the old you cannot push on a string argument and it describes the situation after the global financial crisis quite well when banks refuse to lend no matter how much the government tried to induce them to make loans uh, to make loans. Nor should government policy try to get banks to make loans they do not want to make. After all, if banks are our underwriters, and if their assessment is that there are no good loans to be made, then we should trust their judgment. In that case, lending is not the way to stimulate aggregate demand to get the economy to move toward full employment. Instead, fiscal policy is the way to do it, which we covered earlier. So that was 
the suggestion of increasing capital requirements, which is not really effective. The next one is examining banks at the discount window. One of the reasons that Minsky wanted the Fed to lend reserves to all comers was because he wanted private institutions to be in the bank, that is, to be debtors to the Fed. As a creditor, the Fed would be able to ask the banker to ask the banker a question. How will you repay me? That is, what earning assets are you going to buy? As he put it, the Federal Reserve's powers to examine are inherent in its ability to lend to banks through the discount window. As a lender to banks, either as the normal provider of the reserve base to commercial banks, the normal operation prior to the Great Depression, or as the potential lender of last resort, Central banks have a right to knowledge about the balance sheet incomes and competence of their clients, banks and bank managements. This is no more than any bank believes it has the right to know about its clients. The Fed would ask to see evidence for the cash flow that would generate the ability of the bank to service loans. It is common practice for a central bank to lend against collateral using a haircut to favor certain kinds of assets. For example, a bank might be able to borrow 100 cents on the dollar against government debt, but only 75 cents against the dollar of mortgages, which incentivizes them to buy government debt that can be used as collateral. Collateral requirements and haircuts can be used to discipline banks to influence the kinds of assets they purchase. Examination of the bank's books also allows the central bank to look for risky practices and to keep abreast of developments. It is clear that the Fed was caught with its pants down, so to speak, by the crisis that began in 2007, in part because it mostly supplied reserves in open market operations rather than at the discount window, forcing private banks into the bank that is forcing them to borrow directly from the Fed gives the Fed more leverage over their activities. For this reason, Minsky opposed the Treasury's early 1990s proposal to strip the Fed of some of its responsibilities for regulation and oversight of institutions. If anything, Minsky would have increased the Fed's role and would have used the discount window as an important tool for oversight. Minsky rejected the old mainstream view that the central bank can constrain bank activity by rationing reserves. However, from the 1960s, he argued against the monetarist view that reserves ought to be provided in open market operations, with the central bank creating reserves to buy assets, mostly treasury debt. This is how it works today, by the way. Since that method simply puts reserves into the overnight market for reserves, the Fed funds market in the United States. It provides little useful information on the health of the financial system. If instead the banks needed, needing reserves would have to go individually to the central bank and submit assets as collateral, the central bank would know what they had as collateral. Minsky emphasized that the central bank can get more nosy because as a creditor, it can ask the borrower to open the books. The idea here is not that the central bank would refuse to lend the reserves, but that it would gain a window to financial practices. Unpack that. So currently, when um, banks need reserves, they just sell you know the safe assets in, in last resort to the central bank. That's the way uh, the central bank provides reserves to the banking system. Just sort of an impersonal open market purchase of assets. But what Minsky suggested is that instead, the banks should literally just go to the Fed and borrow reserves from the Fed directly. Banks generally borrow reserves from each other right now. The Fed just intervenes in that market to set the interbank lending rate. But um, the reserves are sort of shifted around between the banks. But Minsky suggests that the banks should just go straight to the Fed to borrow the reserves. So this way the bank, the Federal Reserve Bank can have more insight into what's going on and thus uh, regulate this uh, system better. Once again, as I said before, the entire system, the enti entire banking system is a government uh, program and we're just discussing ways to um, modify it better. Improve it, modify it, make it work as designed, you know. Nima, before you go on, we're pushing a good mm -hmm. amount of time here. Did you want to? Yeah. Did, yeah, we uh, want to read one more thing, or do you want to wrap it up? Wrap it up here and then uh, finish it off uh, some other time. Sounds There's great. Not much more left. 
did you, uh, in conclusion, I just want to go over what, what we looked at looking at unemployment and we've been heavily focusing on, you know, the shadow banking and the, and the way that the underwriting system works. How would you summarize what we went over today? Well, uh, there's a global regime of austerity. There's no need to be concerned about inflation. The global banking system is very unstable and austerity makes it even more unstable. Improvements to that system would be to improve underwriting standards and to make banks go to the Fed and borrow directly from the Fed. Earlier, we discussed the federal job guarantee and how that would uh, go a long way in uh, eliminating or reducing income disparities and promoting a more uh, sustainable and stable and growing economy. I think that pretty much sums up the parts that we read from today. Excellent. Well, let's leave it at that. Thank you, Niba, for going over this stuff again. This this MMT stuff, or I mean, particularly yeah, when, we're, when we're taking it from Minsky and we're really dissecting the uh, banking system, it can be pretty hard to wrap your head around, I guess, because it gets so empirical. For sure. We're like, oh, my God, we're actually looking at real stuff. Oof, what's going on here? But it, it helps to unpack it and then to demystify it. I found, as I learn MMT more and more, and we, we go into and we start unpacking these things, that the situation is actually simpler than I thought it was originally. Do you find that as well? True. No, because there's less confusion, less fog. It's just when you understand MMT, there's so much fog and bullshit and so much more consistency in the overall model that it, it definitely makes, uh, makes it easier to understand. Well, with that, I am going to head this out. I am Dylan Moore of the Volitional Science Network, which you can find on YouTube. And that is Nima over there of EconomicsJunkie.com. And we're graciously being hosted by the Think Liberty Network, which you can find at Think-Liberty.com. And thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Next time.